So that's that. I want to talk about the comfort thing in a little bit. I want to talk about another concept first, but that comfort thing is going to play into when we discuss this other concept of mine, which I call the Prometheus of certainty, which we talked about a little bit before. Um, but I want to talk about first this conflict between these two mythologies. And that's something I also outlined in the paper. The This is the things that I sent you are early sections of the liberal gun owner's law uh, pillar. And the first part of the law pillar is turning out to be its own thing. And it doesn't, it's not about the literal law. It's about the reality of law and behavior. Um, and I, and so that's going to be one section, and the other big section will just be the literal parts. We'll talk about Heller and McDonald and Bruin and the Second Amendment and the NFA and all of that stuff, right? The um, the kind of the predictable aspects of law. I think what we're missing in this society is what I'm producing now, which is we're not asking these questions about behavior, about the reality of behavior about cognition, like everything that we see that happens every day is coming from the human mind. It's coming from our behavior and all of our good and all of our bad. So I don't understand how people believe they can understand reality through just kind of the literal aspects of law without understanding these things first. So I want to talk about this, these conflicting mythologies and <clears throat> the one I call the the myth of maximum deterrence. So this is the belief in absolute deterrence, the absolute deterrent power of rules, regulations, and laws and policy, right? That if we pass a law and Joe Biden says this is going to stop school shootings, that that's actually the power of law, is that we can lay this shit down and the stuff will stop, okay? So we have just discussed that, and I read some very... Um, important quotes in the beginning that show us that the effects of law, the deterrent effects, they happen, but not predictably, not in the way that you would think, and certainly not every fucking time. So you have this one section of society that I think we could put the gun control people inside of that believe that you just throw laws at a problem and the problem goes away, right? Or the problem diminishes greatly. And if it doesn't diminish enough for you, you just throw some more at it, right? Um, so it's not the myth of absolute deterrence. It's the myth of a maximum deterrence, right? This deterrent power is like, well, this is how we deal with problems in society. That's one myth. And the other myth is the myth of the hermetically sealed rights preference. So the person believes in a certain right, and they make that, and then they separate that out of an interactive fabric. Which so it's basically the person that believes the the monomaniacal right absolutist um, believes that this thing that they believe in they get to separate out of the normal causality of of life, right? The normal back and forth, the normal the normal intersection of rights and conflicts of interest that this particular thing gets to exist up on a cloud and never get touched and never get discussed about. And it do, you're not allowed to make any laws about it because it dropped out of the sky from Jesus and George Washington picked it up and then he turned it into a diamond and then it's in America and now you can't touch it, right? So we have these two myths that are conflicting. They're both they're, – they're truths involved in both of them. That's what makes them believable. I think all mythologies, dogma, propaganda, all has truth inside of it. Otherwise, it would be worthless. You can't – People, you can't manipulate people, or people can't manipulate themselves, or they can't reinforce their beliefs unless there's a lot of truth in it. But also, it's both of these myths are full of shit, right? They're both not true. At the very least, they're not helpful. And yes, when we're living yes. in a society, what we want is for things to work. Yes. And if that means we have lots of rights, awesome. We want you to have lots of rights. If it means yeah. we also don't have people running around killing each other for no reason, also, let's let's not have that. And so anytime you have these two possibilities, you want something that works to serve both ends. And that takes work. You can't just yeah. pick one. Yeah. There, it's a uh, um, process. One of the quotes that I read uh, in the literature in one of the sections that I'm – that I um, f 
semi-completed on problem solving is that with major problems, you, you don't solve major problems. What you do is you solve them and then you resolve them and then you resolve them. It's not – you don't get to this place where, where uh, reality, causality just serves it up for you and it's really ba- – you know, it's really basic and you solve it and it's done because that problem is inside the context of reality and it's probably going to shift again. Reality is going to put a pressure on it or something else is going to happen and it might – there might be a derivative that you have to deal with and the first formulation doesn't match the derivative. So – um, at the very least, I keep saying jujitsu because I think it's a great way to look at it. You have to be flexible about these things. You have to be able to judge, process, weigh, right? And there's never going to be a time, I don't think, where where rights don't conflict and people stop having preferences of one over the other. So um, this is another one of those things, This you know, um, people believe that laws have a certain amount of power. People believe that rights get to exist on a pedestal and and um i think up until this point in history we've this is my idea that like we've been able to get by with that that much much mythology and half truths and falsehoods but the internet and the digital age has done something here and intensified things, a lot of good things, but a lot of bad things. And it seems to me that what we're seeing is we simply cannot afford to be this ignorant about facts and reality anymore. We're going to pay for it. And I do think that the nexus between guns and public safety is going to pay for it um, because we continue to believe this horseshit right there's these myths they have partial truth but partial horseshit and i think again if if you and i just had to spend a lifetime trying to get people to understand the difference between actual deterrence and the myth of maximum deterrence and the reality of intersecting rights versus this hermetically sealed rights thing you, well you and i would work two lifetimes probably but that seems like what we're up against frankly it does. And what I found is if it can't fit in a sound bite, it's probably not going to become generally known. I mean, if it can't fit on a bumper sticker, really. I mean, yeah. you know to this day phrases and such from bumper stickers, you know, guns don't kill people, people kill people. That's how that's a whole discussion of personal responsibility and the the limits of deterrence. But it if it's not summed up in in a phrase people are not going to digest it the way they should be and you're right we're living in a society where the negative effects of the connection or disconnect between these two worldviews it's really intensified because people are listening to respond right they're not coming to the table and saying okay look what really works yeah. Because as soon as one person wants to take what the other person has, I don't mean, um, you know, this person wants to take my rights. I mean, anytime I say I want to cut into your worldview just a little bit, it's not seen as a compromise or an offer to compromise. It's seen as an attack. And I yeah. think in this particular instance, the gun rights advocates have more historical reason to be wary of any discussion about compromise because every new legislative session, anytime they agree to a compromise, they're giving up something, but they're not actually getting anything. And the side that wants to take the rights and limit the rights and infringe on the rights is saying, but it's a compromise. I want all of it. I'm only taking half of it. Therefore it's a compromise. Yeah. And when you have this and and you see it in different arenas, not just guns, you become a society that doesn't trust each other, doesn't yeah. trust each other's motives and won't come to the table. Yeah. And so everything I do and everything I say just becomes an extension of my political reality where I need to get more people on my side and I need to make sure the other side's not winning. So yeah, the simultaneous ability to argue with people from all over the world has intensified this in a really yeah. negative way. Yeah. Um, how do you this is a rhetorical question. It's not for Hunter. How do you solve 
wicked, complex, sophisticated problems with mythologies. You fucking don't. And and that's really what what I, I think this episode is about. You can't. Okay, so let's take the first level, which is if you can take a wicked, sophisticated, complicated problem, which most gun-related negatives are, everybody wants to simplify them, but they're wicked problems, right? So how you can take those, and let's say that solving the problem, once you got to it, was an issue. Or you just had to solve it once. You came up with the formula. You did your calculus. You got the formula. You applied it. Mass shootings ended, right? If that was the reality. Okay. Even in, under those conditions, you cannot use competing mythologies to do that. If it's that simple, you can't use competing mythologies. You can't use a world that's believing crazy fucking make em ups and do that. Now, let's talk about what's real about wicked problems, sophisticated problems. As I said just a couple minutes ago, you're not solving it once. You're solving it, then you're resolving it, then you're resolving it, then you're resolving it. You sure as hell cannot do that and have long term, adjustable, flexible solutions, right? While you're using these mythologies, you have to dedicate yourself. To a firmer version of what's true and what's up and what's real and what's more empirically um, accurate. Now, we're never going to erase stories, dogma, mythology from the human condition, right? That's always going to be there. It's like our primitive, it's where we start. But we can reduce it, we can challenge it, right? To get it to be more empirical, less crazy make em ups and stories, right? Um, but that's the point that I really want to make, which is <laughs> these are not just problems you throw the, you know, the AR-15 and mass shootings is the perfect example. We are, I don't want to see another mass shooting. I'm three years past it. It's as aggravating to me as anybody in the, in the, on the planet. I want it to be over. Right? I don't want another one, which is why I'm interested in problem solving. And it just turns out that when you start to look at mass shootings and you look at the, let's say the AR-15, you simply cannot stop them by stopping the AR-15. You might, in certain instances, if you took all of the, all of the semi-autos away, you might be able to get lower casualty counts in the events you might maybe maybe at best yeah maybe at and best. that's what you, all how many trillions of dollars would you have to throw in it's impossible to do it first of all but let's just say you could do it if you could you'd get a maybe and what would happen is you might get lowered body counts or casualty counts in certain events and not all of them like a low percentage of the events you'd get a lower casualty count Maybe. And you may, you, I mean, you're, what you're going to do is you're going to put pressure. It's like whack-a-mole. You're going to put pressure on one thing and the people are going to adjust. And this is right. why you have to, you're not solving the problem of mass shootings by taking away the one thing that we've seen. All you're doing is saying, you guys have to choose a different tool. Sure. And we've seen explosives. We've seen those kind of things. They're not difficult to make. Yes. And body counts could very well go up. And we've seen uh, this trend where people are finding big mass parties and they're driving trucks through them. Sure. And that's sure. something that is directly in response to, well, I can't get this kind of weapon, so here's my new choice of weapon. Yeah. And yeah. this is understood by anybody who's really thought about the problem to any extent. Right. But it's comforting to think that, well, if the person who I elected with 30 seconds of my time four years ago can, with the strike of their pen, without me having to do anything, make it all go away, that's very comforting. Yeah. It's not realistic. And we're not honest with ourselves when we think that can happen. But it's very comforting. And that's what humans want. We want that comfort. We want to, to be able to say, look, this is all we have to do. Yeah, And, and we'll we're, we're all disgusted with mass shootings. And part of the problem you know, that we see in this debate is the one side has convinced itself that the other side somehow supports mass shootings. 
Yeah. You're not going to get anywhere in a discussion when you're calling the other side a bunch of people who are murderers and want to see murder. Yeah. It's just, you're just not going to make any progress. You can easily make the case once you once you drill down one layer and find student threat assessment and behavioral threat assessment in school shootings. You can easily make the case that these people I've seen it on churches. I want to. I saw it on a church when I was in Pittsburgh. I want to live in a country that cares about its children more than it cares about guns. Right, that sentiment. Well, I, I think we do live in a country that cares more about its children than it cares about guns. But the reality is, what they're saying is that you're protecting the AR-15, you're protecting guns, and you don't care about the kids. Well, once you drill down one layer, you see that if you don't know what student threat assessment is or behavioral threat assessment, if you're not looking for that, or if you're not, if you know about it, but you're not prioritizing it in your political or or your voting life, then you also don't care about the kids. Right? We could easily make that sign for that. Yeah, but it, it, it comes down to problem solving, not 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 blaming and not shaming. Yeah. When somebody says, well, then you care more about the kids. I'm saying that sentiment in and of itself presupposes that if I did say, let's get rid of all guns, it would change anything. And the problem is it won't, it yeah. won't actually change anything. So if I'm, if I'm standing here and I'm telling you, Randy, I've got a headache and you say, well, start beating your head against a wall. And I say, no, I don't want to do that. And you say, well, you just want to have a headache. No, I just don't believe that your proposed solution is going to solve my problem. <laughs> sure. That doesn't make me somebody who loves headaches, right? It yeah. just makes me somebody who's thought about the problem and said, this isn't going to do it. Yeah. And it doesn't help that politicians and policymakers don't say, let's pass a law to mitigate this effect. They say, let's end this problem. Yeah. Well, there's a disconnect between what they're actually doing, what the law says, and then what they say the law does. And if you're listening to this podcast, you probably already think about these things. But next time you listen to a politician stump about a new law, listen to the way they talk about it. They don't say, here's what the law says, right? It says, you know, nobody shall, you know, possess this during this time near this place. They'll say this law does this. It cleans right. up the streets. And they have these sweeping generalizations for what the law does, but they don't actually talk about how it accomplishes it. And they let your kind of reliance on this idea that deterrence has a maximum effect fill in that blank. Yeah. And once we start seeing that blank, once we start seeing that they have purposely done that, it's hard to miss. Yeah. I think it's important for people in the community and that listen, you know, for better or for worse, it seems like our community is really focused on acceptance of all people. And and that's great, right? But that doesn't always cotton with being able to properly define liberalism, right? So liberalism, if you define it as everybody gets to come in no matter what, without a judgment you're you're already off the track with liberalism because liberalism isn't about everybody and their mother and the tent it definitely is not it's about accepting people for who they are of course that's true it's about equality and diversity <clears throat> but it's about other things also right and so one of the things that it's about is dealing with information properly, right? And so I consider it highly illiberal for the Democratic Party, in part, to purposefully use misinformation and purposefully act upon what some people call low information rationality or the lack of education that people might have the lack of sophistication that people might have politically, that, that people who vote Democrat or people that consider themselves progressives or consider themselves liberal, I consider that the heinous illiberality. If you purposefully are jerking people around using in misinformation and saying, well, hey, that's just politics, 
That's the height of illiberality, right? So immediately, we should be able to see that if we want to be effective problem solvers, we need to exclude people who do that shit. It's, and maybe we were able to get away with it before. Maybe we had to accept it before because it's the political reality and you can't change it. But again, in this new reality that we're in, I don't think we can afford to do it anymore. And so people need to be able to draw a line between illiberality and liberality. And I think when people are purposefully using other liberals and Democrats and progressives, because that's who we're talking about right now, when you purposefully play on lack of education and lack of sophistication, you've disqualified yourself from, liber from liberalism. You've disqualified yourself from liberalism. And guess what? It doesn't matter if you're white or black or gay or straight. Doesn't matter. Cishet transgender, if you're jerking other people around on purpose to take advantage of them and to take take advantage of the fact that they're not quite as educated, you're about as illiberal as it gets. So that's why, again, this information is here. That's why we're talking about this. We have an entire political party that purposefully jerks people around relative to gun rights and public safety and policy. They I, my contention is I don't know the reality. I know some of them do it on purpose and some of them might just have their head crammed in their ass because they're politicians, right? So that's another point that I think that we need to we need to make here is that when Hunter and I are discussing these things, we're talking about what's the better path to better information. And the reality is, is we're not saying that you can't use legal sanctions to problem solve. It's just they don't always work. They're not always the best first choice. They're not always the best choice. Sometimes they don't fucking work at all. And we seem to have, I don't know, I want to get your opinion on this, Hunter, because you're you're positioned a little differently than I am. I think I'm further left than you. Um, I don't know where I would consider you like libertarian, center right a little bit, left on some things. It doesn't fucking matter to me. But I, you know, I think I'm a little bit a little bit left of you. Um, and I, hold on a second. I'm about to figure out where I, I just lost my train of thought. Okay, I don't get it. Um, yeah. Do you, what, do you remember what I was talking about? Well, you were, you had introduced the topic saying that we were differently positioned a little bit. Um, yeah. And we had just come off the topic of illiberality. Yeah. And the idea that, if you're going to take these steps of messing with people and, and capitalizing on the lack of information and using low information as, yeah, a, as a tool, yeah. then that's yeah. not liberalism. Okay. So this is where I wanted to take it. There seems to be, and I'm writing another section now uh, about this idea. Liberals and progressives seem to have developed and created a quasi-religion out of this belief that because of what's happened in the 60s, which is great, there is a general social myth that when you deal with big problems, you must create policy and throw laws at them. That's the first and only thing that you can do. It's the first and only power that you have that using the government for new policy or better policy, is how you deal with problems. And you believe in that regardless of what the facts are. And you engage in dogma and other things that are – and when I say quasi-religion, I don't mean like the positive in, um, interpretation – the positive um, uh, manifestations of religion. I mean like the ones historically that are like manipulative and fucked up and that's what I'm talking about. This – this quasi-religious belief in something where you don't think about the facts. So I wanted to get your opinion on that because it seems – that's what Jonathan Haidt says some, something similar um, or maybe he says that exact thing. But that there – but it's it's like a religion. Do you, do, you, do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And one of the things that I, I see when I see people 
they said that you know religion is the opium of the masses, right? It's the opium sure. of the masses. But there is an opium of the masses for people who don't consider themselves religious. And what is it? Well, it's their political convictions, right? It's the the sure. ability to feel self righteous about something. Sure. And as somebody who is a little bit center to the right, um, I can tell you that when you're in the center and when you're center right, and you're really not, you know, you you're not extreme one way or the other. And you see a bunch of people going out in the streets and breaking things and burning things down and screaming about change. You're not impressed. You yeah. you don't feel, hey, this is change we need. You feel these are people who are LARPing a civil rights movement that seems less and less legitimate every day because they are out there just to get their own high on their own self-righteousness. Yeah. That's what they want. They're getting yeah. their self-righteous high. Take pictures of myself and post them online so people can say, look at that guy. They're pro-civil rights. And that feeling when you get the likes and the loves and the people saying, oh, you're amazing and you're brave. Like, if you feel self-righteous about something, it doesn't mean it's wrong. But you should be real, real damn careful with anything that makes you get that high. Yeah. And that's why you have this becoming this quasi religion, because I mean, that's what we see with with religious people, right? We get the people who are very judgmental, very self-assured, and you have this idea of the opium for the masses. Now, I'm a religious person, but I'm very wary of when you feel the self-righteous aspect of it, because it is an addiction. When you sure. start to feel that I am wonderful, I am great, I am brave. Yeah. You got to be careful about that. I, yeah. I agree that it has become quasi religious. And the problem with religiosity or religious dogma is that is that's what we hold deep. That's the stuff we're going to refuse to run through that critical thinking process. Once we yeah. hold it dear, we're done thinking about it. Yeah. And it happens left and right. We're not just saying it's, you know, it's it's definitely both sides and where i'm actually trying to apply it here is the aspect that has that believes in the maximum the myth of maximum deterrence there's a religion and it's just as horse shitty as other horse shitty religions that we've seen and it is dead center in the liberal progressive milieu we use the government and we use the laws to to leverage all of the progress that we want i'm not even saying problem solving right um but i think people believe that there's problem solving there but without the facts without investigation we are going to vote and march and do this and do that and it's the policy that's going to solve it and that is directly related to what we were talking about before, when you have a politician that comes up and says, we're going to pass this law, it's going to sweep the street clean. Right. And when I, and don't get me wrong, when I talk about marching, there are times to march. There are yeah, yeah. definitely times to march. There are times to get policy changed and to force policy changes. But the problem is, is when that becomes the way you get the most self-righteous high it becomes your only avenue because no matter what you do, you know, the hard work in the background, that's not going to get you the same, that same high. When you're out there talking to these school districts saying, look, there's a tool that actually works. What can we do as an individual community to implement it? Do you get a self-righteous high from that? Do you get to, yeah. to show off to people how great you are? And there's a danger in that religious dogmatic approach. And, and you do have it. In the gun rights debate, this, I have this religious dogma of all we got to do is pass the law. And most people don't even, like you said, maximal deterrence, not 100% deterrence. Most people are willing to say, well, all we got to do is start passing laws. If we can just get one law on the books, then we can get more laws on the books. Yeah. And you say, okay, well, what's the goal? And the goal doesn't even become stopping mass shootings. It becomes getting guns off the street, getting guns out of the hands of people. Sure. Again, there's this empty space where we just put in that assumption well that'll that'll fix the problem yeah and if if we get guns out of people's hands then then nobody can shoot done problem solved yep. but again it relies on that kind of enthememic uh requirement of maximum deterrence it's not mentioned it's not spoken but we assume it and because we believe it so deeply it's just assumed 
right? It's, it's that yeah. part of us that's not going through the critical thinking process. And when you said earlier, you're talking about scientific, I think liberals ought to be looking at evidence-based approaches. What will fix the problem? Not we've got to do something. And as long as we're doing something, we'll feel good. We'll yeah. feel, feel like we're doing something. And therefore, the problem will get fixed. Yeah. And evidence-based means evidence-based comprehensively, not just evidence-based like the epidemiological, criminological approach that's used by the gun control people. I don't doubt that there's data in there that matters. I'm not saying it doesn't, but there's a lot more to that field of data that needs to be inputted in the reality for us to fully understand it. And and part when you say scientific, you're talking about scientific method, right? You start with the hypothesis, you run the numbers, and if your hypothesis is wrong, you change the hypothesis. But what you see is you got the hypothesis, we got to get rid of guns, you run it through the numbers, and that shows it's not really the issue and say, okay, well, we got to change those numbers. Sure. We got to start looking at different numbers so that our hypothesis can be right. You should be checking yourself when you say, I want this hypothesis to be true before I look at the numbers. Because yeah. what it means is that you've got some internal belief that you're not mentioning and you're not willing to challenge. Yeah. And that belief, oftentimes, when you're talking policy discussions, is going to be the belief in maximal deterrence, this religious like acceptance in the core of yourself that if we just pass a law, we're going to get the result yeah. of widespread maximum deterrence. Yeah. So I want to back up a little bit just to say one thing Hunter said just a couple of minutes ago, there's a time to march. And maybe right here is where we're going to see why I'm positioned a little left from him. I'm also going to say there's a time to set shit on fire. And there's also a time to pull the guillotines out. Or there's a time in the, the tea in the bay, you know. There's yeah, there's there's a there's time for that shit too. I'm not saying that there isn't, right? Well, I mean, but we haven't even tried the fucking smart way yet and people want to burn it down. Like we haven't even – we haven't done shit in my opinion. We haven't done any real shit for the most part. Many people are doing real shit. I'm not saying nobody's doing real shit. People are putting their necks out there for progress. Thank you for doing that. But I think as a society, that's a very small amount of people and we have a tendency to just run our mouths and do nothing. So I think – you know, we want to burn it all down before we've even fucking started the smart path. Um, but I just wanted to say that it's you know, there's the time for March for Hunter, but there's the time for Mianovich to get the torch. No, I'm 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 it. down with the Tea Party. I mean, we have a Second Amendment <laughs> specifically because the Constitution recognizes this. There's, there's a time to burn this shit down. Right. But one of the things we keep coming back to is this idea that of kind of like just the intellectual laziness that pervades. And I don't think it's just intellectual laziness. There was a, a high school mentorship program that I take part in. And one year, we were listening to the high school students talk about their experiences in shadowing an employer. And one of the students was shadowing this nonprofit that got food for people who didn't have food, you know, food insecure people. And she was at this employment where they're on their computers and they're making phone calls and they're doing all this logistics. And she found it incredibly boring. And as she's telling us, you know, her employment shadowing experience, she said, look, um, I thought it was really boring. I don't want to be the person just sitting on a computer. I want to be out there like handing people the food. And I thought to myself, like, that's very candid. And I was really glad that she was able to open up and talk about her experience. But if you think about it, that's how most people are. I don't want to do the hard work. I don't want to do the, the leg work and the sitting in a room and the, and the, going blind on paperwork and doing all the logistics. I want to be the one who sees the smile at the end of the road and has the person look at me and think, wow, you're amazing because you're doing this. I want the yeah. spotlight. And in this arena, that's really what we see is that kind of, well, I don't want to change things. I just want to make a really brilliant Facebook post about how we need to change things. Yeah. And that, that mentality is going to have to change 